Mike, okay? And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, come through the whole course, first with Jim, Pastor Jimmy, and then with myself, uh, because he had his operation. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's been a good time and a refresher for uh, us as well. I told somebody uh, the other day, I think it was Andrew, I told that, uh, you know, those of us who are preaching uh, the Word of God, this is a lifelong commitment for us. This should be like a, it should be like a uh, hobby for us, where we're always into it, always learning, always studying. And so I hope you guys will catch some of that uh, burden in your own lives and a burden to be faithful. Now, last week, uh, we talked about a number of things. We talked about outlining, we talked about introductions. And this week, uh, my wife and I, uh, Barbara, <coughs> uh, started a new devotional by John MacArthur. Uh, we finished one and then uh, we were doing some things and I ordered it online and it came. And this, so, this was a devotional for January the 4th, and when I read it, I thought, this would be good for you guys to hear this introduction. Now this is to his devotional uh, for January the 4th, like I mentioned, and, it, and he entitled it, Understanding Your Spiritual Resources, right? But anyway, uh, a lot of times, you know, I don't do it every time, but I introduce my messages in different ways, but here's a, a great way to introduce your messages is with an illustration. Now we talked about illustrations last week and I'm not going to repeat all of that because of time this, more, uh, this afternoon. But here's, uh, here's how he begins his study. And uh, he begins with a scripture verse and then a title for it. But I want you to hear the, uh, want you to hear the illustration. And he says, the story is told of a wealthy London businessman who searched many years for his runaway son. One afternoon, he was preparing to uh, board a train in London when he spotted a man in ragged, dirty clothing begging for money from passengers along the station platform. His first impulse was to avoid the beggar. But there was something strangely familiar about him. When the beggar approached and asked if the man could spare a few shillings, the businessman realized he had found his long lost son. With tears in his eyes and joy in his voice, he embraced his son crying, a few shillings, you are my son, everything I have is yours. Well, I thought that, and then he goes on with the devotional. That introduced it. That is what this devotional is about. And he, he was able to get a great, uh, a great um, illustration to launch his sermon. And when you, uh, when you can do that one way or another, uh, and with a good illustration as we're talking about now, people will be just sucked right in and they'll be listening. Uh, we do not only tell, we try to, and, and uh, time won't permit us now to go through, but Paul talked about convincing people. Now we know that God is sovereign, He's the one that draws people, etc., but, but we still uh, work to be able to communicate the gospel. Now, second thing that I wanted to uh, mention uh, to you before uh, we uh, move on here this morning, or this afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> I, I've come to the conclusion, and not just with this class, but with others, that in school today they don't teach outlining anymore, because almost nobody understands outlines, and uh, you know, <laughs> With the dumbing down of our educational system the way they've done over the years, I'm convinced that people don't understand, uh, don't understand outlining. And so, uh, whatever way fits you guys, that's fine. But I want to share, share with you the way that I 
do newts, all right? And because, uh, number one, I'm not a great reader. And uh, number two, when I look at a, at a page full of print, I just see black and white. And but boy, when I see that skeleton of an outline, bang, it sticks in my mind. And I'm able to just go right through that outline and I don't have to keep looking like I'm reading it. Now I'm telling you in my younger years, now at 80, almost one years old, uh, I need more help. <laughs> And so I get, uh, I get sometimes looking down more than I would like to, but I can't help that. This is age-related, and, uh, and that's the way it is. So, I told you that I use a format. It's almost like a book. So this, uh, this um, outline will fit right in my Bible. And uh, when I get up to preach, I pull it out. And here's the outline, here's my introduction right here on the front page. Now when I begin to preach, I just, after I'm done with my introduction, I open it. And inside, both sides, I have it in two columns, both sides, I'm trying to hold it up here for the camera. Uh, on both sides of that, I have my outline. And I even many times go over onto the back and sometimes in these later years uh, even go longer than that. But that's what I do. And I want to show you uh, some things about that. So the first thing I want to show you is how I personally go about uh, sermon preparation. Now, we mentioned last week, uh, we mentioned that... Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, cutting out here from time to time. Maybe I better finish this and just try to do one thing at a time. Uh, I forget what I was saying. <coughs> See what I mean, guys? Uh, I, uh, uh, I, in my sermon preparation, and this is what I want to impart, impart to you, the importance of understanding the text, what it is saying. You can write some stuff down out of your head, just shoot from the hip or do whatever you do, and you can choose a big idea. But that may not be the big idea of that passage that you're working with. Now, we're going to be teaching the Word of God. We need to be faithful to the Scripture. The scripture is the basis. Now we talked about illustrations. They only help us to clarify for the 21st century mind some of the things that we have studied and what the scripture is saying. And we talk about an introduction. We talk about other things. These are things that we interject, applications for 21st century. But the whole idea, the whole sermon needs to be coming from the Scripture. So, I wanted to just show you very briefly uh, a, uh, a format uh, that, uh, that you can follow. And you're going to have to forgive me here for uh, just taking uh, some steps with this. And I forget where I am and what to do right now. Uh, right while I'm talking to you. Oh, here's what I do. I have to do that, and then I have to put that away. And I'm going to put the, I'm going to put our notes uh, away here for a minute, because I want to uh, show you, uh, <clears throat> as I already mentioned, uh, my, the, the process that I do. And I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but this is the way I do it, and so I'm going to share with you uh, a document here, and uh, this, uh, this document is the format for that message. Now before I begin the message, I do my study. I do my study, and I'm going to come back to this. You really cannot be a faithful preacher of the Word 
if you're not studying it and if you don't understand it and you don't know it. We're going to come back and talk about some resources very quickly. Uh, and these resources will help you to get into that scripture so then you can shed light on that. Allow that scripture to just become a reality in the minds of your people, but it's the scripture that is the important thing. So here's what I do. I take my notes. I told you that I had them uh, laid out here. And I start, now there's my text. Now I've already put a, and, and I've talked about this passage before, but I uh, did some work on it that hopefully helped. Uh, so over here I put, are you getting my arrow yet? You are. And uh, so I put, uh, I put over here where I preached it, Calvary, ba Calvary Bible Church. Bible Church. And uh, 1.30, that's today, okay? So I put that in there. I have the passage. I'm going to look at Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Now out of my study and all, trying to determine what this, where this passage is going, the main theme, the main idea, the big idea, I, for want of a better term, I call it world missions is God's will. Okay, now that's what I chose. Introduction, you notice here, I put nothing. Now then, as I'm working through that, and I've been studying, and I've been reading it over and over, I'm looking for, th for two, three, in rare situations, four points that are in that passage that 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 uh, that that passage is talking about and uh, uh, some people well that'll be later I'm trying to work with the scripture at this point so I put okay Matthew 28 18 uh, the command giver who gave this command all right we'll talk about that in a minute the second thing is the command of the sovereign one. I probably should have put the, uh, the, the sovereign God or something. But anyway, the command of the sovereign one. All right? And then third is the promise. Okay? So I say, okay, I can see this clearly now. I can see that, and I call entitled the message, Understanding the Great Commission, so, okay, we're going to understand who gave it, we're going to understand what it was, and we're going to understand how we're going to be able to carry this out. This is a big command. How are we going to be able to carry that out, all right? That's step number two for me. Now, step number three then, I come down, I'm still not going to put in an introduction. I'm going to come down and I'm going to outline, if you will, the passage so that my steps are going to come right out of the Bible, all right? Uh, the command giver, Jesus, have been given all authority. You remember that verse says, all authority called his disciples to him. And he said, all authority is given unto me. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Hey, this is the sovereign lawgiver, if you will, right? And so, and so, my first point was, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and in earth. And uh, then, I, then I added this a little bit more here. Jesus is the sovereign God. Uh, the second person of the Trinity he is co-equal. Here's a theological. You guys have been through the doctrine of Christ, uh, the doctrine of God, really. Uh, we talked about uh, we talked about the three persons of the Trinity are co-equal, co-existent, and co. Anybody remember? Eternal. Jesus just didn't begin in Bethlehem. Hey, we're talking about the sovereign God here, all right? We're talking about who gave the command. Now, 
Then, when it comes to the command, I'm not going to read through all these. We don't have the time. Uh, the command. He told, uh, he, he called his disciples to him. He said, I've been given all authority, guys. All right? Now, what I want you to do, and this is, this is the what is the Great Commission uh, point, the command. This was the command that he gave to make disciples of all nations. So, he says here, point number one, that I have under that, that, uh, and this, this is true, and this comes out of your study. This isn't just something that you're may inventing. It comes out of your study. There is only one imperative in this passage. Now listen, when you're going to use words that maybe the guy on the pew isn't going to understand, you need to define it for him. Tell him what you mean. What is an imperative? Command. A command. Now, the only imperative in this whole section is make disciples. And uh, so then I talk a little bit about that. Then, in D, uh, here I put, there are three participles. Whoa! Now, what in the world are participles? And a participle is a verb uh, form used as an adjective or as a noun. So, in this case, uh, here it's going to describe a verb the same way as, a, as an adjective describes a noun. It's going to tell us something about the making of disciples. Now, there are three of them. Now, I know that most translations put go and make disciples, but that go is a participle. And it really signifies going. The last time I referred to this, I mentioned to you guys that Jesus knew they'd be going. Some would be going out of persecution. They'd be dispersed. As they went, what were they supposed to do? Make disciples. Listen, some of them went by choice. They felt the call of God. Paul and Barnabas, etc. And uh, they went... But they went preaching the gospel, all right? So then well, I go through and I'm basically working and bringing some of my study together to develop an outline of, uh, that comes right out of the text. Then uh, the, to short, sort of shortness, we come down to the third one, the promise. What was the promise? I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Hey, listen. You're not alone taking the gospel. Christ promised to be with us, and this promise is the end, to the end of the world, why? Or the end of the age, why? Because this command is standing until the end of the age. When is the end of the age? Christ's second return. Hey. As all of us go through, all the way from Jesus first, or his actually his, his ascension into heaven when he gave this command, all the way to his second coming, he is with us as we are carrying this out. Now a lot of people like to look at the verse and say, oh, uh, Jesus said he's with us till the end of the age. Well, that's true in every sense, but that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying, as you are going, at, and I have a section on baptizing, but I don't want to get into that right now for time's sake. As you are going, as you are baptizing, as you are, what's the third participle? Making. Huh? Making. Making disciples. Okay, the third one is teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Hey, that's discipleship. You see, that is discipleship. All right, so now I've gone through, I've, I've gotten my direction out of this text. I want to clarify this for people. So now I write an, uh, an illustration. It'll take me too much time, guys, to go through this. Uh, I talk about when my father was dying, right? He called us in. There was no joking and stuff. He was taking his last breath. 
And uh, he was telling us some of the most important things in his life. Listen, Christ was getting to, ready to leave and he was now zeroing in, honing in on that which was so important, most important to his disciples slash apostles. They would be the ones that would establish the church. And so he gives them this message. Jesus had come to the end of his ministry. I mentioned it there. So I use that illustration to start to start of my father on his deathbed. And then we come down to the command. Now I'm going to interject a few things here to help people understand. It's so important to know who's giving the orders, right? And uh, so uh, I give an illustration here. My daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, who's now with the Lord, you, most, some of you guys knew Bonnie. And uh, when she was just a little girl, she was our oldest. The second one was my son. And uh, so one day, two little guys, they're playing, and uh, my son starts giving orders to my daughter, who is older than him. And she turns around to him and says, Oh, you already give orders, huh? <laughs> and she wasn't about to obey the orders of her brother, her younger brother at that. Hey, listen, it's very important who gives the order, right? So that's an illustration to try to, uh, to try to shed light on this. And then I go through and I've added some other things. I just would love to be able to preach this message to you, but I can't for time's sake, all right? And see what things I wanted to mention. Uh, and then the promise, okay, let's get down to the promise, I am with you always. Uh, and uh, at this point, you see, he, uh, um, he, uh, he commanded, now he is promising. He said, you look at this thing and say, hey, how in the world can I do that? Uh, take the gospel of the whole world. Well, he told us that he was going to be with us, his presence. His power. As a matter of fact, over in Acts chapter 1, he said, And you shall receive, Acts 1 8, you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit is coming upon you. He was about to come. This was right at Jesus' ascension, right? And, uh, and so power is speaking through us. And uh, so. Uh, he is with us, all right? And then I went to but for how long. At one point I brought the gospel in here. I forget where it was. Uh, teaching them those all center. I forget where it is, but I, I camped on the gospel. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never accepted Jesus Christ. You've never been forgiven from your sin. This is all important as we're building up to baptism. Baptism is only the public recognition of all that went before of the new birth. So that's, that's implied here in this passage. And so make a little challenge to, uh, to the congregation. And then a conclusion. Christ, the eternal God, commanded us to be worldwide disciple makers. That's the command. Be a worldwide disciple maker. All right? All right? He made the process clear. Uh, his promise, now he promised his presence as we obey his command. All right? Now, this is my conclusion. I'm wrapping it up now. How are you obeying Christ's great commission? Hey, sometimes it's good to just pause for a minute. Let what you just said or asked sink in like Andrew did this morning. Don't answer. Nobody answered it. It's between you and God. How are you doing this? Right? Through a witnessing lifestyle? Through giving? One of you is going to be preaching on giving. Who is it? One of you. Uh, and uh, through praying, you pray for our missionaries. 
through teaching our children? Wow. What a responsibility we have. And we could go on. But, or bow your head right now and ask God to help you obey His command in one of these areas or in all of these areas. How does God want you to be a worldwide disciple maker? Ha! Ah, give the invitation now. No. All right. So, uh, that... That's the way I move through a message, all right? First through the study, then the very general outline from the passage, and try to discover the big idea of that passage that you're reading, all right? And then I take that and expand on that result of my, uh, of my study, and then I, I add in illustrations were needed to help clarify, etc. And that's the way I do it. Now, you see in here, you see right here is 1 Acts 2, 37 to 38. Uh, rather than be up there losing time thumbing through the pages, my last page is in this format and I write it. So if I'm not going to ask everybody to open to it, I can just look down and read that Bible verse. It's right there. So I have everything right here in my notes. Now, <clears throat> confession is good for the soul. I did not always do this. I never had a good homiletics course in all my studies. I had one very weak one one time, but so many years ago. And uh, so my experience has been growing over the years. However, through my own study, but however, I used to have a sharper mind to be able to keep some of this stuff in my memory. And uh, I would just have jot down a few notes and a few references, and I was ready to preach. Doesn't mean I didn't do the study. I did, but I could keep it all here. Now I can't. All right? So, uh, that is, uh, uh, I wanted to do that with you. Now, let me say one other thing. Whoa, we've got 15 minutes for me to say this. Uh, let me think how I'm going to get out of Oh, yeah. I'm going to get out of here this way and get rid of that one. And why, oops, why am I not coming up? Here I go. Oop. Click uh, the video at the bottom there below. The camera button. There camera, there. oh yeah. Oh, I think you have no, to stop sharing yeah, first. Yeah, you're still sharing. Oh yeah. yeah, that's why. Yeah. All right. Yeah, See yeah. that? When all else fails, bring your grandson along. All right. <laughs> so <clears throat> now uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about study, and uh, you guys were supposed to read the notes, and we're going to check in there whether you checked off whether you had read them. Pastor Jimmy included a section in here, very good section on resources begins on page 21. Now, guys, listen. If you want to study the Word of God, there are at least some very basic resources that you have to have. You're going to have to make some investments along the way. And you're certainly not going to make the investments all at one shot. Uh, and uh, you're, but you're going to set that goal, you're going to work at it. I don't want to read through every one of these, but these are excellent. I, I uh, personally had most of these. I've given almost all my libraries away now at this point, but I had had them. Uh, Andrew has some of them, Pastor Keith has some of them, etc. Come over to page 22, we see the commentaries, right? And I hope you read, uh, hope you read Spurgeon's uh, 
quote there, number one on page 21, come over to page 22 now, the necessity of not always reinventing the wheel. There have been people who are, have dedicated their lives to study, etc., have written things that we can draw off of that. They have backgrounds far beyond anything we have. And uh, so we need to take advantage of it. Right? Wycliffe Bible Commentary, an excellent resource. One that I, 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 I almost can say this, I never preach uh, or prepare messages where I haven't checked with the MacArthur Study Bible or the MacArthur New Testament uh, or the uh, one for the whole Bible. Uh, excellent, excellent material. And the reason I do that, and I usually tell young guys, find a commentator that you can really trust. Me, for me, it's John MacArthur. Uh, not that I learned everything from him, but it just seems like everything that when I come to look at what he has, that's what I was taught and what I believe. I've come to trust him trust his study, trust uh, all, you know, what he's done, so I always come back. It doesn't mean I necessarily agree with every jot and tittle, but I, I always check with MacArthur. Pastor Jimmy gave you a, um, a, uh, uh, a web address to download that for free on your cell phone. Now some of you I know cell phone computer. I know there's a lot in between. Uh, what are they? Uh, tablets. Tablets and uh, etc. that work just like your phone. So you can get them on there. But I couldn't get it on mine. But I don't need it because I have it in other resources I want to show you in a minute. All right? Uh, so that's a very good Believer's Bible commentary. Uh, another good one. So Jimmy has, uh, has laid out for us a number of extraordinary uh, uh, resources to help us in our, uh, in our study, uh, etc. And uh, so I think that's all I'm going to say. Number 12 on there, the uh, New Testament or the uh, New uh, Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge. And that's very good. A lot of cross references there uh, that uh, you can utilize. So uh, there's Vine, there's Holman, uh, etc. Look at those and see if you can afford them. Now I'm going to take a couple minutes just to show you something else. We are living in a computerized age. And uh, <clears throat> uh, more and more, I. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this. More and more, I went less to my books and more to my computer because I had the same books on my computer. And so, what, uh, what I, I, I want to tell you is that there are, there are several different um, uh, Bible programs. Now there's an expense. If you were to buy all of these books, that Pastor Jimmy recommended here, I'm sure you would be over a thousand dollars if you bought them all. Uh, uh, books are expensive. Uh, Bible programs, some of them are pretty expensive, but not nearly as expensive as buying the individual books. And uh, so, you sort of have to weigh it out. But, before I go further, let me say this. We have a fairly complete library of resources right here, Pastor's office. Pastor Chris left a lot of books. Some, very few, are mine that I'd given to Pastor Keith. And, but that was Pastor Chris's library. And when he retired, he left it. It's there. You talk to Pastor Keith, tell him, look, I'm preparing a message, I'm preparing a program. Can I come into your office and, and look at some of those resources? 
We've also put a few, and Andrew knows more of this than me, a few of them over in the gathering lounge, right, Andrew? Yeah. And so there's some resources there you can get a hold of. But the biggest library is up here. That's a, a, an option for you. <clears throat> now, what I, I do want to show you before we get to the uh, messages this morning, uh, or this afternoon, I keep saying this morning. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, uh, I'm letting notes know. Uh, here's, the, here's the program that I have. Uh, I have used, and let me tell you, this has been for years. Years, more years than you want to know. Uh, I have used two resources. And so the one has grown over the years. And uh, so this, uh, this first one, let me share this uh, so uh, Rocky gets a hold of it. Uh, this first one is, um, is uh, where did I get that? Window. I think Brave. Uh, window. window, you want to hit the middle tab. Now, wait a minute. What you, was I just on? You, you'd want to go window, not okay. tab. Yeah. Okay, there you go, you're right. Because I do have some on the internet. Mm -hmm. So, here's, here's what my layout looks like of it. And uh, so, uh, this, this, uh, here's the library. If I want more books, I click on the library. Whoa. Uh, there, here are some of the books, all right? And so I can go there to the library. This is called an interlinear Greek New Testament. And uh, the thing I like about this, uh, though I <coughs> had a course in Greek, I, don't, I wouldn't want to mislead anybody to think I'm a Greek scholar uh, or really know Greek. Uh, but... A guy named Strong has taken every Greek word and given it a number. And then you can look it up by number, right? And so here's uh, this word beginning. Are you seeing my pointer? This word beginning. In the beginning was the word, all right? Take this word in the beginning. Well, you look straight down from that. And this second row from the bottom, this is the Greek word, by the way, archaic. And, uh, but here's the number for archaic. All right, so click on that. Now down here I have a long discussion about the word beginning, what it means. Get so we can draw stuff from that. And so uh, that is, uh, here's the word logos, all right? And this program is called Logos, and this is where they got it from, this word that means word, right? And so then I can come down and click on Strong's number, and bang, I have it down here. Uh, I can go over here, and I already have it set for John 1.1. 1, 1. Now this first one is a MacArthur Study Bible. All right, now MacArthur's going to start studying. You say, oh, that's pretty small. Okay, well, we can resolve that. We come down here, and it says, float this uh, screen. Now, you guys, Rocky, you're not going to see this one. But uh, anyway, whoop, neither are we. So uh, it's back behind here somewhere. Uh, let me see. Maybe it's this. Okay, I'm not going to get it. But I can float that screen and go over there and uh, I can see that, that that one window will fill the whole thing. I have things down here, dictionaries. Uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, I can't even remember all of their names. These are Bible dictionaries to look at the meanings of the Greek words. They don't always mean what you think they might mean. And so we can check them. All of these are commentaries. Here, up here uh, in this window is um, Wearsby's, all right? So I have his B series. I have his New Testament, his Old Testament, right? Uh, and uh, I just have a lot. Here's Word Pictures by a guy named Robertson. Uh, really good books. I have all of these books. 
and we got to move on. I got many more. I got Bible dictionaries, uh, ISBE, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Just at the click of the mouse, I have them. I can go right to what I'm looking at. Now, to buy their cheapest program, it's almost $300. Then to buy the next level up, five hundred. Next level around a thousand dollars. So uh, you uh, you have to take that into consideration. Now they also, and I don't know how this works. I don't want the time to go take time to go to it here. Uh, they uh, also say a free registration for the online version. Now I don't know whether that means. It's free or not. You can go to Logos and uh, you can look for it, see if you can find that. If you can do it online and it's free, uh, well, great. And so, uh, <coughs> oh, here's the full window. I knew it was hidden back there. It is free, but it's um, basic, though. It's what? It's free, but it is basic. Oh, it is like basic. Like those books like you have there, oh, you okay. never get it. Okay, and you can also, I forgot to mention, get the basic one, but you don't get a lot of stuff like Dan is saying. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one other that I want to recommend to you. I don't think it's quite as user-friendly, but my very first Bible program years and years ago, and I still use it till I went to Apple, and now it's more difficult. Uh, but now I'm going to get rid of this first, so I'm going to dock that window. And now that's back, and then I'll get rid of this. And so, uh, stop sharing. And, uh, and it's called Online Bible. This guy used to always give it for free. And has a lot of resources. Not many contemporary resources. Uh, a lot of those that are what they call in public domain, but very, very helpful, and I don't have time to go and show you what it looks like. Uh, I don't know why I can't get on here. Uh, uh, hit the camera, second from the left. Oh, uh, yeah. There you go. There you go. So, anyway, online Bible, uh, maybe not quite as... Somebody turned their mic on. Uh, maybe not quite as user friendly, but has a lot of good information on there. However, in order to include some contemporary things like the ESV, uh, they have to pay a royalty, so they pass that on. So you can get a CD for a little less than $40. And it just has so many resources that you won't use hardly, you, know, you won't scratch the surface with it. And for you guys with windows, you get all of that. I have a stripped down version of it that will work on Apple, but it serves my purposes and I use it all the time. Okay? So, I wanted to have that time to talk to you about resources. Guys, you need resources. Come here to the office and use them for free. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Jimmy was saying. Yes. Yeah, and, and down here. But I, Jimmy. Uh, go ahead, Jimmy. I just want to make, yeah. Uh, mention to them Laridian. L A R I D I A N. Laridian. That's a software they can get, and the very entry software gives them a quite a number of commentaries, quite a number of things you mentioned, uh -huh. the $99. Wow. It'll work on their computer, it'll work on their Android, it'll work on their tablet. Loridian, it's much cheaper, but still very uh, intuitive like Logos. Very good. Thank Loridian. you, Jimmy. I'll look into the Loridian Bible. Loridian, okay. You guys got that? And... Uh, you, you have to have resources. You can't just get up and shoot from the hip. And they, these resources are what help you to develop all the different areas that we were talking about in order to preach a message that is Bible-based, that is passage-based. We call that expository preaching. All right? 
So I hope you guys will do that. All right. Uh, if it sounds like I'm rushing things, I am. Because uh, I want to get two guys in here today. And as I mentioned to you, Pastor Jimmy, you're going to be evaluating, right? And Andrew's going to be evaluating, and I'm going to be evaluating. So we want you to come. We're going to give you ten minutes, and when I signal your time, can you do timer? Sure. Okay. And uh, when, when it's ten minutes, you stop mid-sentence. Mid and then we're going to give five minutes for everybody uh, at that point to, uh, to give your, your evaluations uh, of it. So you're going to critique each other. Now listen guys, if you get up to preach sometime, you're going to have tougher critics than you're going to get in this room, let me tell you. Because <laughs> all of you guys are going to go through the same thing, so these are your friends, alright? So, uh, who, uh, let's see, we only have time for two, and we've got at least four wanted to go today. So, let me uh, just call, uh, let's see, we'll start with... Uh, with uh, Bruce. So Bruce, you come. Clock's just ready to tick. <laughs> and uh, you let us have it. There. Bruce, do you want me to put this somewhere you can see it too? Or No, I've been uh, playing with my timer. There trying. you go. Right. Get it timed. <laughs> okay. Alright, you're on. <laughs> Hit it, Andrew. Okay. Or do you have one there? Ready? Yeah. Okay. Question for you. Days or ages? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 31, no doubt the easiest place to find in the Bible, describes God's creating the universe and its contents, where each stage is done in a day, and uh, each passage ends with, and the evening and the morning were the first day on the second day, and so on. Questioning whether they are standard 24-hour days or symbolize longer periods of time, which Charles Ryrie calls the day-age idea, basically questions whether uh, God is God's ability to do the miraculous. So, when is Scripture to be read and understood literally? As the Bible's first book, Genesis sets the stage for everything that follows. God wants His Word to be understood by everyone. Therefore, it had to be written in the most understandable fashion, which uh, Richard Emmons, writing in Israel, My Glory, says, uh, interprets words and phrases using their normal, usual, customary meaning, including the use of figures of speech. So, in other words, to be read literally in the context of the passage, and I want to touch on interpretation and translation shortly. Uh, despite controversial issues like the safety of COVID vaccinations, people generally trust science to solve problems and answer questions beyond the grasp of the everyday person. Uh, Science-based subjects taught in schools prepare students for jobs in engineering, teaching, medicine, and bolsters this trust. Science typically relies on tangible evidence, theories, excuse me, tangible evidence, testing or observation to answer questions or develop theories. Hence, science eschews the biblical account to estimate the ages of the universe and the earth. Astronomy and geology are based entirely on processes occurring over huge periods of time. The estimated age of the universe is 13 billion years, calculated by observing distances between galaxies and the rate of speed they are moving away from each other. Imagine baking a loaf of raisin bread where, as the dough expands, the raisins move apart in different directions. Uh, this derives from the Big Bang Theory, which assumes all matter, uh, assumes all matter uh, started from the explosion of a single point called the singularity, and um, just they're expanded. I kind of think it's interesting that when they discuss the Big Bang now, they drop the word theory, except in the TV show. Anyway, Earth's age is estimated to be about four and a half billion years forming from a cloud of material that developed the whole universe, I mean the whole solar system. This estimate comes from radiometric dating, which measures decayed substances from naturally occurring radioactive material in rocks 
Then using known rates of the material's decay, they develop a ratio to the remaining radioactive material, and it's science's best guess at Earth's age based on the oldest known samples. So are the universe and Earth really this old? The Bible gives no clear indication of the time between creation's last day and later events. Christian believers attempting to biblically support the day-age idea cite from 2 Peter 3.8 that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Or in Daniel 9.24-27, events prophesied to occur over a period of 70 weeks should be taking place over 70 times 7 years. Using 2 Peter 3.8 by itself to support the argument deviates from the context in verses 4 to 10, which warns that God is giving man time to repent before unleashing his wrath. Whereas single verses such as John 3.16 and Romans 8.28 can stand by themselves and are encouraging, a single verse does not truly support arguments outside the context of the scriptural passage. Daniel's use of 70 weeks in a prophetic sense is an example where allegorical interpretation, rather than literal, may be applied. Translating the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, presented numerous challenges, among which has been how translators reconcile differences among all the manuscripts. At present, there exist over 3,000 Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament, 8,000 manuscripts of the Latin Vulgate, and 1,500 of the Septuagint. With all these many manuscripts available to examine and compare, textual scholars have reconstructed the original text with more than 99.9% .9 accuracy. This reliability allows analyzing the biblical passages pertaining to creation to also support the 24-hour interpretation of day and literal meanings elsewhere. John MacArthur states that uh, God created the universe and world by his word ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing, implying God's existence before the events. Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5 reads, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. The, night, uh, the light he called day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Both times day is singular in the Hebrew and Aramaic, therefore also in English with no implication anywhere else in the passage that time is more than a single day. Additionally, evening and morning, the normal diurnal rhythm, do not indicate either period extending beyond their norms. Just as God's creation started in darkness or night, Jewish holy days start at sundown, hence the evening-morning description carries the promise of a new day following the night. The Hebrew word yom for day is used in all of chapter 1's creation narrative, including its plural form in verse 14. Strong's exhaustive concordance uh, defines day as meaning to be hot, a day is in the warm hours, whether literally from sunrise to sunset, or figuratively, a space of time defined by an associated term. In verse 5, the associated singular terms evening and morning preclude interpreting more than one of each. Strong's concordance lists only one different form of day in Genesis, used in chapter 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Obviously, it meant the morning of that following day. Furthermore, Genesis 1, verses 14 to 17, only a single standard day is meant in relation to other cycles. And God said, let there be lights in the expanses of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night, and the stars. Seasons and years are made up of single days. Chapter 33 of Jeremiah primarily describes God's assertion to keep a descendant of David to rule over the descendants of Abraham. In verse 25, God, in reverse fashion, affirms this covenant equally as binding as his design of days, seasons, and years. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with the day and night in the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of David. 
In chapter 1 of Genesis, only a literal 24-hour day can be surmised for each of the seven days in the creation narrative. Why would God need so much more time when speaking everything into existence to begin with? I described the day-age idea as an example of misunderstanding scripture by not reading literally and in context. Figures of speech and symbolism are more readily recognized when reading literally and in the context of a particular passage. Isaiah 53, 1 reads, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? God, being spirit in nature, does not have arms. However, in the context of this prophetic section, arm represents God's strength. Jesus' great commission to make disciples requires believers to know scripture. Christ-focused witnessing can go off the tracks with questions like, was the Red Sea's parting literal or symbolic, or was Jesus real? Out of respect to the listener, address such questions, but don't let them become debates or mini-sermons. As Paul admonishes us in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And here we have another example of recognizing a figure of speech, in season and out of season, where it does not mean the annual seasons, or planting or harvesting, or mating or calving seasons, but be prepared to present the gospel of Christ at any time a scripture discussion or witness opportunity arises. Thirty seconds. Ah, uh, let's. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. For, I, I guess I spoke too fast. There you go. <laughs> and I'm not going to say any questions. Oh, you can do it. Less than ten minutes. That's no problem. Yeah. Are okay. you done? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, you heard it. Uh, anybody have any message of critique for Bruce? Jimmy, you can answer, or you can uh, speak up, too. No, we got that. Anybody? So, Bruce, uh... Yes. The, uh, she... Um... Jimmy, you're breaking up on us. say that you were cut... I said, uh, as I well, this is there. Um, hold on. As I go through the sheet on uh, different aspects for uh, evaluation, I think Bruce's material uh, obviously was well organized. Well, it was well defended or whatever. Uh, and he was confident in sharing it. Um, I, I have to say, though, the presentation came much more as a teaching slash lecture. Um, I, I realize at the very end, uh, you know, Bruce brought it home to a, a a sense of well, as Christians, we should always be ready for an answer. Um, I, I think he spoke clearly. I think he spoke at a good pace. I think that he was confident. Uh, he didn't have any ums or uh, you know or, or, or things that take your attention away from what he was saying. Uh, I had to say that in ten minutes he gave buco information, which for the average listener might have had some challenge to remember it. Well, uh, on one hand, it was very, very well done. On the other hand, expository preaching. Uh, um, again, I, I just rest on the fact that Bruce, uh, it was a good, it was a good lecture, um, and you know that, that's where you left me. Okay, it was good. And uh, anybody else before Dave comes up? Oh, oh, oh no, go ahead, Dan. Uh, um, to me, it felt, um, you know, like I said, I commend him for being up there and everything else, but it did feel like a lecture to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, if, you know, anything like that, it's just like you went to a science class and explained certain theories and everything mm -hmm. else. But like something that I would take away and be able to share with somebody, I could. Okay. Good. 
Good. Thank you, Danny. Somebody else? I thought at the end we got to your, you believe it's a day is 24 hours, and you don't believe the day is 1,000 years. We got that. Did I get that right? Correct. That's what you believe. Mm -hmm. so, I, so you got that across. I like uh -huh. that. I think, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to chime in with, with, with my, what Mike said. That, uh, I thought this topic was a really great topic. I would love to sit and converse about that, you know, because uh, it's not, in, in my mind, that's, that's not debatable, but, but you gave all the debates on it, and uh, there, there is a, a lot of debate. But, but for me, I like the grammatical, historical approach to hermeneutics, and, uh, and that it seemed to me to be the right interpretation of them. But as uh, Danny said, and I think Jimmy said, uh, there was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Good lecture. Excellent. Yeah, great lecture. A yeah. lot of work went into it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. We have to uh, Dan uh, Andrew, are you going to say something? Oh, just quick. I was going to say that I think you can tell pretty quick in listening to somebody whether what the Word of God says is of the utmost important uh -huh. uh, importance because sometimes you know people will kind of uh, use the scriptures when it supports a certain idea, but then kind of abandon it in other places. And I can just tell in your preparation that no matter what other theories and other ideas were floating out there, it always comes back to you, but what does the Word of God say? So that was great. So good. Just, I, I could sense that in the preparation stuff. Good. Very good. All right. Now, uh, Dave's going to come. Uh, Rocky, next week you're going to be presenting too, right? Okay. I'm up. Yep. Can Pastor Jimmy mute himself again? We all set? Uh, yeah. Okay. Tell me when. Actually, maybe, uh, maybe we can have Pastor mute the microphone before we start. Uh, Pastor Jimmy, would it be okay to uh, put the microphone until... There we go. Okay, you can go ahead then. Okay. You can mute his. No, he muted it. Got it, sorry. Okay. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Acts uh, chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. In this passage of Scripture, we see that the early church is going through a time of severe persecution. Let me summarize the action for you. In this passage of Scripture, the Apostle James is violently killed by Herod. When Herod discovers that this pleases the Jews, then he arrests the Apostle Peter and throws him in jail, hoping to do the same to him. Then what we see is the church is earnestly praying for Peter. Then we come to see Peter in jail, and what we find is that he is bound between two soldiers, and he's sleeping. And then he is miraculously delivered. In these events, we should see that God is sovereign and we must trust Him. The star players, James and Peter, made up two-thirds of Jesus' inner circle. Jesus worked closely with Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And God permitted James' life to be taken and Peter's life to be spared. Why did God do this? We don't know. There's no significant difference between the behavior of the two men that suggests that uh, they should uh, be, uh, any action should be taken one way or another. And Scripture does not reveal God's reasons. But Romans 9 teaches us that God is sovereign. And what he does, he does to serve his purposes. 
we need to recognize this. In this passage, someone did recognize this. And that's the church. We are told that while Peter sat in jail, the church prayed. This is an important event. It's one line and it's easily overlooked in this passage. We need to be careful about that. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. And praying to God, we acknowledge His sovereignty. They could have been out plotting an escape for Peter. They were found praying on his behalf. We need to see the importance of this and do the same. Back in the jail cell, Peter was sleeping. Does this sound like Peter? Why was this man sleeping on a night before his certain death? Peter was impulsive, he was impetuous, he was act now, think later type of guy. I'm talking to a bunch of guys here, I bet you can relate. Peter was the guy that cut off Malchus's ear. You remember that? Jesus was about to be rest, arrested. He pulled out what amounted to a jackknife and sliced off the guy's ear. It was embarrassing for him when Jesus had to reach down and reattach it. But why has Peter changed? Well, I suggest three reasons. Number one, he has learned from his experiences. Secondly, Jesus had told Peter something about his future. And thirdly, Peter has the Holy Spirit reminding him of these future things. Think about this. Peter had lived three years in a day-by-day -day walk with the Lord and had some difficult experiences in addition to the Malchus's ear episode. He also had almost walked on water, did so for a little bit. I remember Andrew talked about this a few weeks back. And as soon as he took his focus off the Lord, he began to sink. But also he publicly denied that he knew Jesus three times. He also had some good experience. Remember that Acts 5 teaches us that this is not the first opportunity for Peter to be miraculously delivered from jail. Through these experiences, Peter had learned to trust God. And as we live our life, we will do the same. Secondly, John 21 records that Jesus had told some things to Peter in a post-resurrection meeting with him, making it clear that he would live to an old age. If he was going to live to an old age, he was not going to die at the hands of Herod. And he knew this. At this same meeting, Jesus told Peter not to worry about things he could not control and commanded him, saying, You Follow me. It says the same thing to us. God may uh, have a violent death for us in our future. He did for James. But that can't be our concern. And Peter had learned this. Finally, in John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will remind you of the things that I said. Between then and now, Peter had received the Holy Spirit. He recognized his significance, and he trusted him. According to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, we have that same Spirit. Through his interactions with Jesus Christ, resting on the truth of what Jesus had told him, and through the strength of the Holy Spirit, Peter had learned to trust God in all things. We can and need to do the same. I started a business a few years back. My wife and I prayed about it, and we thought that God was in it, and so we dove in, and we were pretty successful. God blessed us well, but after about five years, the receipts dried up, and I began to panic. So I said, well, I 
I need to go out and I need to get a job. And I went for a job interview. And I was going to take my family to a place that was far away from their family, a you know, place that wasn't familiar to us at all. I went on that interview. They didn't like me, and I didn't like them. <laughs> and it turned out that uh, both my wife and I during that time got sick and ended up in separate visits at the hospital. I was the second one in. My wife uh, came to visit me. I, she caught me confessing to God that I had doubted that he was still in that business with me. And I confessed my lack of trust in him. Shortly after that, I got out of the hospital. He gave me some work, and I've been working ever since. You know, we may not find ourselves in a jam as hopeless as Peter. On the other hand, who knows? Maybe we will. We may not always be able to count on a miraculous delivery from our circumstances such as this. Maybe like James, we'll be called to give up our life. Like in the early church, persecution may come. But Jesus says, what is that to you? You follow me. God is sovereign, and we must trust him. Okay? Amen. 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 How much time did I use? Oh. Uh, you had a minute and 20 left. Is that right? That's, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's always acceptable. <laughs> All right. Do we have to do anything to get Jimmy's mic on? No, no, he, he did it on his end. Oh, okay. All right. Now, uh, any a couple minutes to critique here? I got your big idea. Yeah. Uh, that's a, <laughs> that's what I was going to say, too. I like that you kept going out and coming right back to it. Every point that is was sovereign something and, we must and trust coming him. back. Mm -hmm. Very I good. like that. Good. Good. Very good. Anybody else? Elijah. I was just going to say, it sounds like Pastor Jimmy unmuted him. Oh, Pastor Jimmy? Look, looks like Rocky unmuted himself. Jimmy, you there? No, his uh, mic yeah, is uh, yeah, unmuted. Yeah, Pastor Jimmy, you're still muted. Gotta unmute. Somebody's got to oh. unmute him on the desktop there. Andrew. I don't, I don't, I don't, there it is. Okay. Um, Dave, your closing, uh, your closing illustration was very well chosen, uh, very appropriate. Uh, my only thought, and, and you know, I think all, over and all, the, the message brings home uh, a truth that, uh, you know, we all need to apply. I, I just think expositorily, um, you you were kind of on, on a number of different passages. I understand that you did that with a purpose, but, uh, you know, when we do expository, we look at one passage, we, we try a little bit to stay there. And work that passage, draw that passage out, uh, and to defend everything that we want to speak about from that passage. Um, so at any rate, uh, you know, just those comments. I think you uh, you handle it well. Uh, think that's. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Somebody else. Something you did that I feel like I have a hard time doing is. Uh, I felt like uh, like you knew you were speaking to all the men here. So when you uh, asked us the question about Peter and his character, like you you knew the audience of, of who you were speaking to, and you kind of formed your illustration based around what would ring home for us. Um, which sometimes I feel like I have a hard time doing because I I'm with the youth so often. A lot of the illustrations or places I think to go is something that maybe you know the middle schoolers would bring home for them, but sometimes on Sunday mornings it's hard to kind of reprogram and target a different audience each time that I'm doing something, but I just thought you like you knew who you were talking to very, you know, today, and that was, that was good. Okay, yeah. thank you, Andrew. Elijah, you had a... Yeah, all I was going to say is, I, yeah, I really appreciated, brother, how, how you kept us on track with your, with your thought process. Um, it sounded like you really, you, you knew the direction you wanted to go with each of your points. Um, I think it's a way of critique. Maybe, I'd be curious to hear, like, even just your, your thoughts from Scripture, whatever may have it, um, as far as, it, like, what are, the what, are, what are the ramifications if we don't learn that God is sovereign and we need, we need to trust Him? Right. Like, for the sake of, for a brother or a sister who doesn't know the Lord, like, if we don't, yeah. if you don't figure this out, where are you headed? Where are you headed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably good thought. Good. Thank you. Bruce? Yeah. Uh, 
fact that you you know mentioned Peter, John, and James as uh, Jesus' inner circle, and yet kept the focus on Peter without really ignoring the other two, uh, just to bring the point out, was uh, I think a really good technique. Okay, good. Anybody else? All right. Hey guys. Well organized. Huh? Well organized here on oh. the computer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rocky. Yeah, thank you, Rocky. Would have never got all that information done in time, you know, unless it was organized with the thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so, right through. Okay, very good. Very good. All right. Um, very good. That was exciting. That was good. Both of you guys put in a lot of work, and we appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll be looking for the rest of you next week, right? So we have Danny and Mike and um, Dale and Elijah and Rocky <laughs> next week. All right, very good. Hey, that's good. And uh, I, uh, well, next week we'll, we'll close out. Just want to thank you guys for uh, uh, attending the class and for all that. Uh, the hard work you put in. We've probably made more um, demands on your time with this course than others, but uh, we're really starting from scratch. 